the three. We're going to start there. While we're getting going here this morning, I know it's hard to get away from the, uh, the meal table and all that the first thing in the morning. And if we can get everybody in here, it takes a few minutes. I know you're all up, but boy, when you get that, you get breakfast going there, you know, and that gets to be real good too. Um, I wasn't, I was on my phone just a minute ago. I wasn't trying to be impolite. We have some folks in our assembly that have a, just had an emergency with their family and I was just trying to keep up with some of what's going on with them. But uh, I went home last night and I didn't actually turn my phone on until this morning. When I was coming here, I, I said stop and get something, and I, I used my phone to pay for it. And all of a sudden, I had all kind of Twitter. <laughs> you know when you're on Twitter, it comes up on your phone? I got all these Twitter things, about 50 of them. And there were people tweeting the, the message in the study last night. And I thought, well, that's good. <laughs> and I just looked then, I had a, had a note <laughs> from Hawaii so we got up early to see the studies this morning <laughs> and said, great to have the Internet. So we want to welcome folks on the Internet. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day in Chicago. It, was, it got almost to be 70 yesterday. It's not, not going to get into the, out of the 50s today, I don't think, so it's going to be a little chillier. But uh, Brother Denny said he was fishing, but he hadn't got many fish on, on ice yet. I asked him, so well, are you, when you pull them out of the pond, aren't they frozen already? <laughs> and uh, we... We have had a kind of a kind of a, a cool winter, but winter is supposed to be cool. It's supposed to be cold in this part of the world, and uh, it allows. If you you see in the front, right in, out of out in front of Alex's uh, office there, there's a there's a tree there that's got beautiful blooms on it. See that? Yeah. You notice it doesn't have any leaves on it yet. Yeah. I don't think I ever saw a bush bloom that beautifully with not a leaf on it. You know they're wanting to come out. <laughs> They're wanting spring, so I'm praise the Lord for that. But uh, anyway, uh, we, what we're going to do in the morning sessions, I'm going to teach three sessions this morning, I hope, as time, as I pay attention to the time. And uh, then we're going to have two sessions this afternoon. Brother Ted's going to do one of them, and then I'll do, do, the, do the last one. And what I want to focus on in, in these morning sessions, the, the overall theme that we had for the weekend uh, is we, if you see the, 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 the DVDs and things, and we just call it Facing the Future in Faith. Because you and I live in a, in, in, at a point in time where uh, things are changing. The world as you have known it is going away. And the world that's coming, you're really not sure what it's going to be. And we're at that pivotal point. And as a, uh, just as, as a person, as a preacher, I, I've always tried to be a big picture kind of person in the context of, of, of thinking about the work of the ministry. And this weekend, uh, one of my, my goals through the years in, in having this weekend was to, to try to convey some of that big, pic, big picture to you ministry-wise. I'd like for you to be able to see the ministry more than just the day-to-day -day details. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I just got a call from one of our families. Uh, they had a son. He, he's in the hospital. He's on life support. That's the moment. That's life right now. That happens. You get interrupted with it. You're, you know, you're here, and boom, there it happens. And that's, that's called ministry, is part of what the work of the ministry is. When people say, wish we had more people, that's what you get when you get more people. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's why some people would rather just have a Facebook account and that kind of stuff because it's, you don't have to have that kind of thing. Um, I mentioned earlier yesterday, uh, last, last week, I, my grandchildren are uh, at our home on Mondays and my wife babysits a couple of them and the five-year-old he said, where are you going, Grandpa? And I said, I'm going to jail. And he said, oh, he got all, he, he starts crying. Grandpa, going to jail. 
is she going to come back? <laughs> and he, well, no, I'm going to go visit somebody in jail <laughs> who is a member of our church. So we got jailbirds in the church. <laughs> no, it's just someone who's, who's in jail. And, and uh, actually, it's, a, it's a kind of a sad situation. But that's life, and that, that's ministry. And you get caught up in that, okay? But you need to be able to back up. And what, I, what I'm trying to do with these meetings and, and always have is to try to back up and let you see the bigger picture of what the ministry is about. And uh, I, I want you to be able to have Paul's perspective on the world and the, cu the culture and the ministry that, that, that you're a part of. Um, we've done through the years some rather forward-thinking kind of things. Back in the 90s, I, I taught a series that uh, most of you guys have never heard. I, I think I look at this crowd and most of you weren't there. In fact, almost all of you weren't there. And it's the kind of thing maybe we should do again sometime. I call it the doctrine of the city. And when we develop the idea, as you're developing uh, understanding what the ministry is, we start out by saying we're going to rightly divide the word, so we need to have Paul's perspective on how to do that then you want to do the work of the ministry. Well, perfected saints have to do the work of the ministry, not just anybody. So you need Paul's perspective on how to perfect the saints. So we develop that. Then now you've got perfected saints wanting to do the work of the ministry, but you need to know Paul's perspective on what the work of the ministry is. Everybody will tell you what their denominational ministry is. What their but what's, what does Paul say the work of the ministry? So as we each step, as we went along there, when, we do, when we're talking about the thing about Paul's perspective on, on, on the ministry, <coughs> excuse me, those of you watching the video know that I used to do that a lot. <laughs> I don't do it as much anymore. <laughs> I can keep my hair out of my face too now. Um, <laughs> see, I, I can just, on those two things, I know who's, who's watching the class and who isn't. <laughs> But when we talked about Paul's perspective on the ministry, what we, what we discovered as you go through Paul's ministry is that there's, there's a cycle that Paul goes through in his ministry. But the focus point where he started is Paul targeted strategically located population centers. We call those cities. And that was, what, well, that was where Paul, when, when he would travel, he would go to places where there, were, where, where there were, were cities. And I got to thinking, well, why did he do that? And then you begin to study the Bible and you discover that the city was God's idea originally. It was co-opted by, by the sat satanic program. And the first city man ever built, Cain built it as a monument to his own rebellion. And cities from, from then until the New Jerusalem are cluster points for man's rebellion. And that's why that's where Paul would would, would, would uh, focus on because that's where the battle is. And so when you begin to understand that, you begin to know know how to kind of focus your ministry. We talked about the local church being the issue, uh, and, and how value how how that's the the primary focus for the ministry of the body of Christ at large is, is through the work of the ministry done in the local church. And so getting that perspective of what the ministry is. And what I want to do this weekend is to try to do something of that nature by, in this first session, just talk about the road ahead. What, where are we going? What's going to, we're moving into the wintertime. You know, we went through those th things back in the 90s about the seasons. And we're right in the middle of winter right now. Uh, our culture has gone through, uh, Western civilization, British and, and American culture, has gone through, goes through cycles and in, in, in Genesis 9 terminology, it's, it's spring, summer, fall, and winter. Now, the, the, the uh, people that develop, you've heard about uh, the, the Generation X and the, uh, the Baby Boomer Generation and the GI, you, that, that, the people that developed that terminology wrote some books, uh, especially a book called The Fourth Turning, uh, Strauss and Howe. And it, it, that, that information is just absolutely fantastic as far as if you want to understand the development of our culture and the way that society is working. When I read that book the first time back in the, in the 90s, 
I'm reading it, and I'm thinking, you know, this, this is exact. These guys don't know anything about the Bible, but what they're doing is teaching what the Bible says nationalism is going to be like. It's, it, it was just the most weird thing. And then when you, so I, I began to take the, the scripture and put the scripture to it. And when you see that, and you realize that where we are today is in what's called wintertime. And back in the 90s, we were in the fall. You remember that? And I told you winter's coming, and we talked about preparing for winter and what to do. We're in the middle of winter right now. And the wintertime runs from about, uh, about 02 to about 25. Well, we're, we're in, what, 14? This is 14, right? Not 13? Uh, time goes so fast, I can't keep up with the years, you know, much less the weeks and the days. We're right in the middle of it. And when you get in the tipping point of the winter, where, where we are now, things, the, 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 the crisis point of winter comes, and you begin to move into the to the, 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 the movement towards spring. And if you go back and you read some of that, the, the characteristics, if you want to know what winter is going to be like, don't look at the fall. See, the problem with people trying to prognosticate things is they say, well, if things go on like they're going right now, you know, it's going to be bad or it's going to be good. And it never goes on like it is right now because there's always that generational curvature that turns the, the culture. But if you want to know what the next season's going to be like, don't look at this season or the last one. Go find the, the, the last winter. Go find the, next, the last spring to see what spring's going to be. And you can, you can map the characters, the characteristics. And our culture right now is going through exactly the paradigm. Well, you say, well, what's, what's ahead? I don't care about the culture out there so much. I care about what I'm supposed to be doing in it. Are you with me with that so we understand that? I just want you to know what I'm, where I'm trying to go with this. Ephesians, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, when it says perilous times, come over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Um, you get a little light on what perilous times are like when you go back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and Paul talks about, he uses that, that term. He talks about his, uh, his ministry. Verse 23 says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more often, deaths often, in prisons more frequently, and deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beat with a rod, beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Uh, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that he went through. He wrote this in Acts 20 that isn't recorded in the book of Acts. In Acts 20, you don't read of any shipwreck he's been in. That's in Acts 27. Here he says, uh, I, thrice I've suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. <laughs> That's a tough deal. You don't read any of that in Acts. The book of Acts is not given to you to show you everything Paul did. The book of Acts is a record of, of God setting aside the nation Israel and why he's just in doing it. But you don't get your ministry pattern out of the book of Acts. You get your ministry out of Paul's writings. So he says, these are the things I went through. In journey, uh, verse 26, in journeyings often. Now here it is. In perils of water. In perils of robbers. In perils of my, by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. <laughs> now, you want to know what perilous times are? That's a description of perilous times. Tough times. Not just, oh, somebody said something about me. <laughs> That's not what that says. That's the guy coming up hitting you inside the head with a two-by-four. There's perils in, 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 of robbers. We got a, we got a, a memo from the uh, Rolling Meadows Police Department some time ago about warning about people that were going into churches in, in, our, in this territory around the, in, in the suburbs out here and going in the morning service and standing up in the service and, and, and robbing people and, uh, it, it, during the meeting. And one of our couples, uh, they told me, he says, now, Brother Rick, if that happens, I got my permit now. <laughs> my wife's got her permit. You just tell everybody to duck. duck. 
I will take care of them. <laughs> I don't think that's what Paul did. <laughs> Perilous times, difficult times, times, times that are not, they're, they're dangerous. Can I tell you, you and I haven't lived in, those, in that kind of a world. We live in a kind of a world today when people think that they're suffering for Jesus and suffering for, for the truth of God's Word when somebody just insults them or disagrees with them or calls them a name or ignores them and doesn't speak to them when they walk by them in the hall or something. You know, we, we, we live in a world that we, where, where people are such pansies, they don't know anything about real peril. That's going to change. You need to understand what's ahead for you and what's happening in our world today is all of the, the stuff that's been there where you've been accepted and it's been okay, it's gone. You read on down through that verse, for men should be lovers of themselves, of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, here's what you do when you love yourself. Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. I read that thing, it says, without natural affection. Yesterday, while we were preparing here, a young man called me. He has a ministry down on the other side of town. And he said, I just, I, I've got this lady that I'm dealing with, and she just had an abortion, and she's all guilty, and she's crying, and she's, she, she, she wants some scripture. And, 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 and he's telling me about the terrible situation and her, how, how, how uh, uh, emotionally uh, wrecked she is from the abortion. And I said, well, here, we went over some verses to give her. And I said, now be sure to tell her that the answer to sin is the cross. I mean, if you had an abortion, you feel guilty, good. You ought to feel guilty. God help you if you kill your baby and you don't feel guilty over it. But the answer to that, guilt, is Calvary. But be sure to tell her that if you, don't, you won't need an abortion if you didn't commit adultery or fornication to start with. You understand, the way you get rid of abortion problem is you don't have kids out of wedlock to start with. That'll take care of 90... I, don't, I bet you not 2% of people, married couples, have abortions. That's not who's having abortions. And if you want to get rid of the, the abortion problem, don't go down here and pick at the abortion clinic. The answer is it the, it's the getting, not the having. But to change that, you've got to change the person. And I told him, I said, be sure to tell her that the cross takes care of that too. You need to get saved. <laughs> you need to be, have, have God change you inside. And you see all the stuff going on in the world out there. The cross is the answer to it. And there isn't any other answer. And when you don't have the answer, this is where it goes. Traitors, verse 4, heady, high-minded, uh, high lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You go to any Christian bookstore and you can find book after book after book that fits verse 7. You can take any Sunday school curriculum from any denomination in America today, fundamental, evangelical, modernist, liberal, I don't care, it'll fit verse number 7. The whole church today out there is ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's where you are, right there. And the world you live in has hit the tipping point politically, socially, economically, and it's changing. And the world as you've known it, if you're under 30, you haven't known the world any other way than it is, but if you're over 30, the world you've known, that you've known, that you grew up with, that you were trained in, that was sort of cleaned up and structured based upon some Christian Christendom, okay? A lot of us, my age, you lived in a culture that was kind of disciplined with a legalistic Christian dumb. You know, we, then when I was raised, boy, you, you didn't dare catch a grass on Sunday. 
You know, you might not go to church, but you didn't cut your grass on Sunday. You didn't work on Sunday because that's the Lord's day, and you had to take that, yes, the Lord's day all day long <laughs> kind of thing. And what that does is it, 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 makes, it makes a nice little structured kind of cleaned up community. And sin is where it ought to be. It's in the gutter. It isn't there anymore. It's paraded all over. You look at the inability of our culture even to be able to, to define what marriage is. I'm mean, a six-year-old kid that flunked kindergarten can figure out what marriage is. But our politicians can't. And our culture can't. Because the underlying understanding has changed. It's always been there. Listen, the war, lost people have always hated God. They've always hated the Word of God. They've always hated the gospel of the grace of God. That hasn't changed. What's happened is there more and more, there's less and less of the truth and more and more of their lie, and there's more of it now. And they can show themselves more because their numbers have increased. And what you're seeing now, and it's tipped now, where if you stand out on the street, out in the public, and you preach what the Bible says, you're a hate monger. And if you preach the, the lie, you're a success. I can remember in the late 1960s, I was just a young guy preaching at the mission in Mobile. And there was an old fellow who used to come there, and I thought he was a nut. He was passing out things about that one day the United Nations was going to make the Bible hate literature. And I thought, what are you talking about? You've lived to see it. And it's not the United Nations that does it. It's the U.S. government that does it. So you've reached a tip. The world is changing. And listen, it isn't going back where it was. Sorry. <laughs> it's not going to go back there. Verse number 10, but, they, uh, but thou, here's the response you ought to have to this. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Paul says, you've known, Timothy, look, you know, the, you know my doctrine. That's where the answer starts is in Paul's doctrine. You've known my Man, my, my manner of life. Paul's life was committed to one thing, that Jesus Christ might be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. He wasn't out trying to get a 401k retirement program so then he could serve God. Excuse me. He wasn't trying to have a good, a good steady income so he could keep up with the Joneses. He said, I've got one purpose for me to live as Christ. And Tim, you've known me. You've been with me from Acts 16, from the early days. You know what my life's about. My purpose. Paul said, I, I got a course, and I'm going to fulfill that course. My faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. He said, you've seen me deal with people. You've seen me deal with people trying to kill me. People contradicting and blaspheming what I'm saying. And you've seen my patience with them, my long-suffering, my charity. When he says in verse 11, the persecutions and afflictions which came un upon me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, that's back in Acts 13 and 14. And sometimes people say, why at the end of Paul's life does he go way back to Acts 13 and talk about those persecutions? The reason for that is that when you go through the book of Acts and you start the book of Acts, who is, who's being persecuted? The kingdom church, the Pentecostal church. Why? Because that's what God's doing. As soon as Paul's ministry starts, that persecution leaves them and those churches have rest, Acts 9 says, and now the persecution follows Paul. Dr. Henry Gribby used to say the only stocks and bonds Paul ever had in the book of Acts were ones he got in jail. <laughs> and that's a demonstration of the fact that Satan knew what God was doing when the program changed. 
That's what he's referring to. Verse 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What do you do about it? But thou, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The salvation in that verse is not salvation from hell and the wrath of God and the penalty of sin. The salvation is from the stuff that he's just been talking to you about. You know in your Bible every time you read salvation, it's not like Acts 16, 31, having justification. A lot of times, most of the time, salvation isn't the initial salvation. But the context always tells you what it is. And here the salvation is from all that stuff Paul's just talked about that he's been going through. How do you get delivered from it? The answer is going to be in God's Word. When he says back there in verse, uh, uh, whichever one it was, verse 11, which persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. God's truth. There's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will with the temptation also provide a way or escape that you may be able to bear it. The escaping isn't that you get that you're, you you don't ever have it happen to you. It's that it doesn't destroy you, and you can get through it. You will endure. You can endure because you will endure. And Paul says, Timothy, the thing that will sustain you through all of this is the book. And it's going to be the book rightly divided because it's the book from the, that, that, uh, that you got from me, the doctrine that you got from me. Now, it's important to understand how do you get to this place to start with. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. You need to have a clear understanding of how Things got where they are, so you know how to go where they need to go. First Timothy chapter 6. If you know how things got in the mess, then you can figure out how not to get there. I use illustration all the time. I go out for the past 27 years. I've been going to, to Detroit to do TV programs. I go out to O'Hare. I go out to the airport. I go to the same, same terminal. I fly the same, almost all the ways, fly the same airline. And... I go down, and I used to, when I flew northwest all the time, when, when there was a northwest, I'd go to the same, go to Terminal 3, go down to gate number, number 9, and for three years, that's the gate I went out of. I went down there one day, sat there. They called the plane. I went and got on the plane, and I'm riding in the airplane, and they say, you know, we'll be in Kansas City in half an hour. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not going to Kansas City. I called the lady back, and she says, no, this plane's going to. I said, no, I got a ticket. She said, you can't be on this plane. I said, oh, I agree, but you're not going to put me off at, at you know, 27,000 feet. I'm not getting out. <laughs> now, how did I do that? Well, that's before 9-11. Well, you can't hardly do it now, but I mean, I, I just, I just by habit went to where I was going, and they let me on. They, nobody paid any attention. They're busy, and you just, I just got on. And uh, when I got off that plane in Kansas City, there were two red coats there waiting for me. They took me down. They were holding a plane to Detroit, put me on first class, sent me to Detroit, and I guarantee you, there's not any record of me ever having been in Kansas City. We just expunged it. I didn't have a ticket to Kansas City. Can you imagine if they kept a record of that? Somebody found that, you know, it would mean. But I went to Kansas City. I got on the wrong plane. I went to the wrong gate. And once that plane took off, you know where I was going? Kansas City. Makes a difference where you get on. And if you get to the wrong place, you can go back and find out. That's what I said about the abortion thing. If you go back, if you got to the wrong end, you go back and find out how you got on that train. Don't get on there again. First Timothy chapter six will help you. Verse three: If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now those are not. He's not talking about if if a guy doesn't preach out of a red letter Bible. The words of Jesus are not all in red. There's some more words of Jesus. Paul told the Corinthians, he said, since you, speak, you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. 
The words that Jesus Christ spoke through the Apostle Paul is what he's talking about here. And if anybody doesn't consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said, if, you, if, if, if any man is spiritual, thinks himself to be a prophet, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of God. If a guy can't understand that, he doesn't have the Spirit of God lead him. He's not talking for God. He's whistling a tune of religion. If you don't consent to wholesome words, if you don't follow the revelation of Jesus Christ to you through the Apostle Paul and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, the only doctrine that will produce godliness in the life of a believer is the doctrine that Jesus Christ gives you through the Apostle Paul. So if you're back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and early Acts or Hebrews to Revelation trying to teach doctrine to produce godlikeness in people, you're going to fail. I just told you what's the problem, 98% of what goes on out there. God says, we believe you to be, by, be, be saved by grace through faith. Let's take up the tithes and offerings. And he does it with a straight face, not knowing that he just contradicted himself. Ever learning, but not able to come to the knowledge of truth. Got no idea what he's confirming. Watch, watch what he says. Who is that guy? Now, this is hard. Hang on. He is proud, knowing nothing. You see that? That cuts you, doesn't it? But doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railing, evil surmising, perverse disputings. That sound like denominational religion to you? Biting and devouring one another? Of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth. So you go out and try to preach grace to people that don't understand Paul's ministry, and who are you talking to? Can you understand why you have problems with that? They're proud. Know nothing. They just want to argue about words to no profit. They're filled with evil surmising. They're going to accuse you of all kinds of things that they just supposed you did. They'll take the things you did and impute evil to it, and then they'll make up things you didn't do and impute evil to that. Romans 3, 8, that's what they did to Paul. If you hadn't been there, folks, you hadn't lived. <laughs> that's fun. Destitute of the truth. Family down the street, they're out of a job. They're running out of money, can't pay the mortgage can't buy groceries, we say they're destitute. These folks are destitute of the truth. Supposing, now watch, gain is godliness. Their definition of success is that gain is godliness. Gain is whatever will get you more. More people more money, more recognition, more clout. That's how the charismatic movement took over fundamentalism and evangelicalism back in the 80s. You go through fundamentalism in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and the whole deal was bigger is better, gain is godliness, and we're, godly, we're God's people because look how we're growing. Look how big we are. Look at our stars. And then the charismatic movement came through, went through them like, like, like wildfire through dry hay. And by the end of the 80s, the, the, the fastest growing, the list of 100 fastest growing churches didn't have fundamental Bible churches in it. They were all charismatic churches. And there were strange charismatic churches, assemblies of God, Mennonites, Nazarenes, Methodists. <laughs> and you say, whoa, but gain is godliness. They've got to be God because they're big. And the fundies start scratching their head and say, what's going on? You ask a preacher today, 
We get literature here all the time. What's the best way to make your church grow? Somebody tell me. There you go. Music, entertainment. You want to, we got churches around this neighborhood that have been Bible churches for 50 years, longer. One big church, right, 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 not the two big churches within just spitting distance of here. One an evangelical free church, one an independent Bible church. They did a survey of the neighborhood and they found out that one of the things that keep people from coming because they had Bible in the name, they took Bible out of both of them's name. Now, they did more than that. They instituted an entertainment program system, second only to Second City downtown. Music, pretty people, gorgeous facilities, lots of things for your kids to do. You say, where's doctrine in that? Oh, well, uh, wait a minute now. We can't have that. We got the media, we got the, you know, we got the bells and the whistles, and we don't have screens like that. We got the big stuff up here, you know, and we, you don't need to take your Bible. They put it up on the PowerPoint for you. You say, where's doctrine in that? So, well, that was why we, that's why we were little over there. That comes from that mentality right there. Gain is godliness. But who is it that thought that? He's proud doesn't know what he's doing. He's arguing about things that don't make any difference. He's, dis he's a perverse disputer with a, with a mind that's been corrupted by error and he's destitute of the truth. That's who you want to be? That's what it is. That's where it comes from. That's how it got that way. Verse 6, but Godliness with contentment is great gain. Oh, gee, manibity, Paul, what are you talking about? Get a letter from a missionary, and he says, you know, godliness with contentment, if we had a computer, would be great gain. I think about that verse back in Psalm 119. I've thought about this for years. Great peace have they that love thy law and aren't going through a midlife crisis. <laughs> See, we add that stuff. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness, thinking like God thinks, rejoicing and delighting in what God's doing, and being content. Knowing I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ, knowing who I am in Christ, knowing what my, what my responsibility is, and knowing that I have a life of purpose and meaning given to me by the Creator because of it, that's enough. Content. If you suppose gain is godless, you think you could be content. Old Rockefeller, they asked him one time, said, how much money do you, do you want? He said, no, I don't want it all, just a little bit more. I knew a farmer down in Alabama when we were down there. He, he, owned more, he, owned the, he was the largest landowner in Dallas County, Alabama. And he had a farm right next to some people in my church. I was talking to him one day, and he says, you know, you know, preacher, I don't want all the land. I just want the land right next to mine. There's no contentment in that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment and a computer. Let us therewith be content. <laughs> now, where do you get godliness? Look back at chapter 1, verse 3. For I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach nor the doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Fables are, look how big we're growing. A fable is a story that has a moral to it. Most of what's done in evangelicalism today, fundamentalism is basically gone. Most of what's done in evangelicalism is just storytelling. This success, that work, this didn't... You say, where did, where did the Bible go? Where did doctrine go? Where did truth go? 
oh, well, we'll get a verse that'll, that'll teach that. No, no. Why don't we get a verse that te- Why don't we go teach what the verse teaches, not get a verse that teaches what we're teaching? Neither give heed to fables in its genealogies, which minister questions. That's how you get over in chapter 6. Rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. Godly edifying. Building up the inner man of a saint based upon the program that God has an effect for him. Well, where are you going to find the program God has an effect for him? Verse number 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. Verse 16, how bit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth the law, uh, uh, all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. God has given us a pattern. He's given us a godly uh, 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 system of information, a gospel, and a pattern through the ministry of the Apostle Paul that's called in verse number nine, uh, 10 and 11, sound doctrine. You see, we don't teach this, we don't, we're not teaching Bible doctrine. You, Bible, the law is Bible doctrine. The kingdom program is Bible doctrine. Noah building the ark is Bible doctrine. We're talking about sound doctrine. We're talking about the doctrine that is dispensationally correct and applicable to us and produces sound, strong, living faith produces life it's an interesting thing uh, hold your hand and come over to second corinthians chapter 6 one of the things that people are always complaining about is that grace ministries tend to be small i've joked with people through the years and said if you got more than eight people, you got more than Noah had. Of course, if you go watch the movie, you didn't even have to have eight. Never judge a book by its movie, will you? The Noah movie was not based on the Scripture. The Noah movie was based upon uh, pagan, occult, flood you know, every ancient culture has a flood epic. And the Noah movie was based on them. There are no rock angels in the Bible, and, but there is in the Kabbalah. Okay, so, you know, I read the book too. <laughs> Second Corinthians 6, verse number 8, Paul talking about his ministry. By honor, by dishonor, by evil report, good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known. You see that? You're going to be as unknown. Why would that be? Well, in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, verse 10, he says, therefore I take, verse 9, he says, my grace is sufficient. For my strength is made perfect where? In weakness. You see, if, you're, if you have the mentality that gain is godliness, you don't want to be weak. Because weakness is not getting more, it's, getting, it's having less. It's not being known, it's being unknown. And if your definition of success is more gain... What are you going to miss? It's in my weakness, my, my grace is made perfect. My strength is made per- perfect. But remember, in, in that weak appearing, you look small, but what did the verse say? As unknown and yet what? You will have an impact spiritually far beyond your apparent size. But you will only see that by faith in some verses. Okay? Write that in your mind. Because that's how you have to think about the ministry. So when you're trying to be more effective, 
It's not going to be with more money and with more people and more buildings and more clout and more notoriety. It's going to be with truth and the preaching of the truth. And when people don't want it, you're just going to say, but that's always... Listen, the grace movement, true Bible Christianity, has always been an underground movement. When you study church history, a few years ago I taught a whole whole weekend on on from Antioch to Rolling Meadows. You remember that? Some of you weren't. You guys, you, you, all you new guys, I keep, I keep thinking, you, all this rich history, you missed it all. <laughs> I got it in my mind. I, and we, I traced for you, drew it out on the board here and traced the whole weekend of how what Paul preached in the first century and started at Antioch there, there is a representation of that message all the way through in every century of church history, you can find your kin folks. Now, they didn't know everything you know, and that's, that's good because it's, it's good we know more than they knew. You build on their shoulders. We'll talk with you a little bit about that next time. But they're there. People preaching salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. People using the same Bible you're using, that had the same verse. In fact, if you go through your Northern European history, you'll find in the six in the six hundreds, you'll find Bible versions that how that translate verses, and the translation that they use are in your Bible today. It's fascinating. That's why it's called the received text. <laughs> It's the one we have received. And even in its translation, it's been passed down because they got it right and then they put it. We've been there. Where are we in church history? We're not there. Why? The people that write church history are Roman Catholics and Roman Catholic sympathizing Protestants. They're the institute. When you study church history, you study the institution. That's not the real church. The real church has always been an underground movement. What's coming ahead for you and me is we're going to be an underground church. But we've always been that. But when you don't understand God's Word rightly divided and you think you're supposed to be out here gain His godliness, and that's your whole perspective, and that is the whole perspective of the system. Because it is destitute of the truth. It is proud and knowing nothing. Why? Because they don't consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you wind up with just more and more, verse number 5, biting and devouring. You see in the end of verse 5 what he says to do about that? From such, do what? Withdraw yourself. Get out of it. You know why? Because you don't have any fellowship with them. And if you fellowship with them and you stay, pretty soon you're going to be excusing them and you're going to become just like them because the only motivation for you to stay with them was that you bought in to gain his godliness. What are you supposed to do? Verse 10, verse 9. But they that will be rich. Notice it's a will issue. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lust, which drowned men in perdition. Chapter 1, he talked about some people making shipwreck of the faith. They drowned themselves in bad doctrine. For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the opposite of godliness with contentment is great gain. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now look at that passage carefully because people hate that verse. And people use that verse to ridicule the King James Bible, and the people that are doing it are guilty of what the passage is talking about. 
When he says the love of money is the root of all evil, he's not talking about you as an individual loving money. He's talking about the ministry loving money. He's talking about the love of money in the work of the ministry. When the ministry says gain is godliness, they are saying, I love money. Go back to Hosea and watch him say, give, give. That's what religion does. And when he's talking about the love of money there, he's just talking about more and more of the gain is godliness. They will be rich. The objective is gain. They got the wrong priorities, and it comes out of the wrong message. Now, where should you be? Verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. <laughs> Verse 5. Withdraw yourself. When he says withdraw, he says turn around and run. Feet do your duty and shirt tail fan me while I fly. As they would say in Alabama. Doesn't mean dilly-dally around with them. Doesn't mean act like it's okay to be them. It means get out. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. That's exactly the opposite of all that stuff in verse 9 and 10. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. So first you flee all that stuff. Then you add into your life, you add into your ministry, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. And when you get all of that done, verse 12 will be the natural result. You're not going to have to go looking for a fight. It's going to come. Just be ready and get on with it. Now, when it says fight the good, the, 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 the good fight of faith, that's Paul's perspective about what is, gonna, is going on. That's what the, what, what, what's happening. You don't have to look for the fight. It'll come. I want you to say something about the fight. Go back to chapter 1. Verse number 18, I charge, this charge I, I, I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee, on thee, with, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Do you know the difference between a fight and a warfare? Yeah. A fight is one battle. You can win the battle, lose the war. Lose the battle, win the war. The war is the big thing. I got a fight. I'm punching it out. But when you war a warfare, you've got a, a, you got a strategy. This battle is a part of a bigger strategy. Okay? You got a big picture going on here, and you know what's, what's going on in the fight. You know what this fight's about. Not only do you have a, a strategy, you have fellow soldiers. You see, the good fight is a part of a war. It's not just me out on the corner picking a fight with somebody, <laughs> but we're a part of a warfare. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, I love this verse. Verse 26, 1 Corinthians 9, 26, I therefore so run, not as, as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. You ever tried to hit something and miss it? <laughs> he said, I'm not missing. I'm punching them right in the snout. I'm landing the blow. Shadow boxing? <laughs> Is that what you said? <laughs> I don't know if it's shadow boxing or not, because that's not that, that your opponent is yourself in that, but uh, <laughs> Beating the air means you, 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 you miss, you don't hit. He said, look, when, I, when, I, when we hit a blow, we hit the target. So the, the, the goal, that's Paul's perspective of what, here's where we're, we're in perilous times. 
We're to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We'll look at those verses next in the next session. That means there are going to be some hard hearts out there that don't like what they're hearing. I go into it knowing that. And I know that the answer to what they're hearing, what they're not wanting to hear, is not a bunch of religious mumbo-jumbo that just tries to convince them to come down here to the church because we're all real nice people. It's the gospel of the grace of God. It's how that Jesus Christ died for their sins, paid for what's wrong with them, and will give them life if they trust Him and they need it because if they don't have it, they're going to die and go to hell. And there's a spiritual reality in all that. You need to have Paul's perspective. You start out with the big picture. The big picture is that God created the heaven and the earth. And when he did it, he had an intention. Ephesians 1, verse 10, God has one grand purpose for his universe, and that's to exalt his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, above all things. That's the Father's plan, that his Son would be glorified. He created the heavens and the earth, a heaven and an earth. He intends his Son to be glorified in two specific realms. Therefore, he has an agency to do it in the earth, the nation Israel, the subject of prophecy. Starts in Genesis 1-2 and goes all the way through your Bible to the time you come to the Apostle Paul. And it has to do, there's a purpose in that. And they're building a nation. They've got to reclaim the earth. Then he says, I've got another purpose that I didn't tell anybody about because I wanted to demonstrate my wisdom. And it's about this new body of believers, the church, the body of Christ, that I'm going to use to possess the heavens. And that's what I'm forming today. I'm not forming Israel program. I'm not trying to build a nation. I'm not trying to reclaim the earth. I'm forming a spiritual body of believers over here through faith in, the, in, in His Son that He puts in His Son, makes them, gives them everything that He has in Christ for them, and uses them in the ages to come. That's what God's doing today. God's not building religion. He's not building nations. He's building the body of Christ. You want to do what God's doing? Do that. Paul's perspective is that's what God's doing. Our task is to be about what God's doing, not over there building Israel's program, not over here building a nation and building social justice and trying to bring, bring all that stuff about today, but it's to build the church, the body of Christ, just to have a perspective that focuses on what God's doing in, in Christ. Our weapons, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. What's our weapon? It's the gospel. It's the cross. It's God's word rightly divided. The cross says Satan loses and God wins. <laughs> in the earth through Israel, in the heavens through us. And you need to have a clear perspective of what's that. Listen, don't learn right division just to prove that some denominational situation is wrong. Learn it so you know why. You, why did you learn it? So you can know what God's doing and you can be about that and you can protect people from being carried back over into what he isn't doing today, but he will do one day. You need to have a clear perspective on the work of the ministry. Because what's going to come in the future is you're going, to, you're going to have to develop a new form for that work of ministry to be transmitted. The old forms are going away, folks. We're in a transitional generation now. People my age and, young and, and, and older are, are has-beens as far as the future is concerned. There's plenty for us to do right now because we're still here. <laughs> Okay, there's still plenty of the old, old world still here. But if you're 30 or younger, when you get to be my age, things are going to look so differently that there's no way for me to describe to you today what they're going to look like. It's going to be your responsibility to take the truth and put it into the new skin. Form follows function. Religion gets it the other way. They build a box and say, come jump in it, Lord. That's the opposite of spiritual 
organization. Spiritual organization is God's life begins to work, and then you put a form around it to make it more efficient. All right, we're going to take a break. We're going to take 10 minutes. There is coffee and stuff in the back if you'd like to go there. When you hear the song, we're going to sing one song. We'll start again, okay? Now let's take a break for 10 minutes.